Hey guys, welcome to webinar number seven. This one is all about bluffing, different situations, different scenarios, um, but most importantly, as usual, we're concerned with why we do what we do and thinking about why we do it. Um, Universal Replay for some reason is acting up, so I have five hands that I'm gonna individually copy paste in. I feel like I'm in the 1950s or something. Um, so basically, well, the first thing with bluffing that we have to keep in mind is overall, when we bet, for whatever reason, there's a bajillion reasons why we bet. Guys that I've coached, they know some things about this. You could, you know, see bet, you can bet min to induce, you can do all these different types of things. But when it comes down to it, there's two reasons why we bet. One is for value and one is for bluff. And then each intricate Thing that you're trying to do in the hand can be grouped into those two broad categories. So that's really important to remember. We bet for value and we bet to bluff. So the first thing I want to talk about is, do you know that you're bluffing when you bluff? Okay, so in a hand like this, this is pulled from an 18 man that Quicksilver played. And he makes this raise right here. Now, just looking at this, can you guys tell me the pros and cons of making a raise in a spot like this? Let's just say you have no information. You're just a, an overall idea. Pros and cons. Cheap steal. It's true. We're risking... 900 total to win 1100 that's pretty good 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 that's a con definitely big nix is saying it's an awkward stack to pot ratio if we're flatted uh, because there'd be 2600 in the pot and the villain would have 5400 left which is about a two stack to pot ratio and with five three offsuit that's not exactly the stack to pot ratio you want to have because um, that's how you get in awkward situations. Um, any other pros or cons? We stay aggro. That's good. Because we always want to be aggressive if possible. So, I mean, these are just a, a few. I mean, we could talk about this for days. Um, thank you. See, maybe you guys don't know who this guy is, and that's totally fine. I don't expect you to. Now, Puyon knows this guy. This is a player who's never going to fly unless, like Alistar is saying, Alistair. Wow, I'll call you Alistar. Bruno Nero. <laughs> this guy doesn't flat. And we know that for a fact, unless, he's right, unless he has a big hand like Kings, Aces, and he's trapping. He's never going to flat call trap you with Ace, Queen, or Ace, King. But that's what's so cool here because Big Nukes is saying a con to raising here is it's a weird situation if we're flatted. But if we do it against an opponent who doesn't flat, then it's a great time to do it. Okay, so that's just one example um, of a great spot to like raise full preflop. And we're going to come back to this hand later and kind of analyze this spot. Um, but what's interesting here is if you look at this, does your hand really matter? If your opponent doesn't flat call. Now, guys that I've coached uh, know about this stuff, um, but it's still worth it to think about this. And for some of the other guys who are here, like, hey, Gente, I'm not sure if, if you guys have gone over this kind of stuff at all, um, but this is something that can help a lot. Um, I'm sure you probably know because you ship two MTTs like a baller. Um, but this is just really interesting stuff here. Um, and even if you know it, it's a great reminder that our hand really doesn't matter. Like, if we, for instance, raise here with aces and we misclick fold to a shove, you bluffed. Congratulations. Like, it feels really, really gross to think that we just bluffed with aces, but it's possible. Um, so another example of, of a time when uh, you're bluffing, but you might not know you're bluffing. Um, this is something that is much more difficult to see.
How about this hand right here? I'm pretty sure you all throw in a raise right here, correct? Does anybody shove this preflop? It is profitable. The big blind is 45900. Everybody has an average of 9000. You do have 10 big blinds. Cool. Minray sounds good to me. So I have a question for you, Agente. If the only time, well, Big Nix has somewhat of a point. I mean, I think you can shove if you're in a situation where, yeah, when guys are restealing too often. I like over shoving where you block people's reshoves. I like that. But the majority of the time, that just doesn't happen. Looking behind us, the small blind is a great player. We have another hand coming up with him. Um, I'm not too sure who the guys in the blinds are. But either way, let's think about this. Uh, yeah, 3,200 could block a resteal. I could see that. It seems gross. Here's my question for you. When we min raise here, which is a super standard play, okay, Assuming we're not shoving, which I hope not. Um, are you bluffing without... Like, Agente, think about this. If Johan F-bomb shoves because he's not going to flat because he's really good, you're bluffing against Johan F-bomb. You will raise, he will shove, and you will fold. Okay. Jason, is Jason on the call now? Okay, cool. Jason, you'll like this, dude. This is right up your alley. In, in this spot, Jason, we're making a super standard min raise open, right? We know that, yes, effectively you have a true big blind of 10. They average out to 9K. The true big blind is 900. You have 10 big blinds, and we're not going to shove it. We have a beautiful stack. We don't want to jeopardize that. And we know that the small blind is a great player here who's never going to flat call. So min raise is, is pretty easy right here, assuming we're not shoving. But Jason, check this out. This is what's cool. We're talking about bluffing when maybe you don't realize that you're bluffing, right? Because this is something that took me a long time to recognize here. Because I, I see it folds around to us in the cutoff. We have a nice stack. The stacks behind are nice. It's a standard open with fours, but we're bluffing here. So two things. One, let's say all the players don't flat behind you. If they fold, your hand doesn't matter. Therefore, it's a bluff. If they reshove, you probably don't call unless you're drunk. So that means that you fold. So your hand doesn't matter. You bluffed. But then we raise it. We always raise it because, oh, it's a pair. But let's say that now someone flats you. Four socks. <laughs> like, I guess it, it's better than a bluff in the sense that you could check all three streets and still have showdown value. So maybe this is like a, a little better than a bluff. It, it Big Nick has a point here. It's more of a semi-bluff because, yeah, there's some value. It's like a very weak semi-bluff. It's like... It's weird because semi is usually a prefix that represents half of something. Like a semicircle is half a circle, right? A semi bluff is half a bluff. This, if we had to give this a name, this is like a a quarter bluff or a one eighth bluff, <laughs> something like that. Maybe a one eighth bluff because you have a one eighth chance of flopping a set or something like that. But it's definitely it's like something. It's like greater than zero bluff, but less than semi bluff. So maybe this is a quarter bluff, but it's really interesting because in this quarter bluff, and I'm going to start calling it that now, that's cool. Um, your hand flops like shit. So it's one of two things now. What that means is start folding pre-flop because your hand is shit or start raising more hands that are shit. And that's the key. Because 
that's how we can adjust. We can either start folding fours or we can start raising way, way wider, right? And that's really important because folding doesn't earn you chips, but raising wider does. And I think that's why in, in a spot like this, if we're raising fours, we should also be raising seven, five suited, stuff like that. Because it's, you may feel uncomfortable playing seven, five suited posts and you fold it pre because it's seven, five. But fours we raise because it's a pair, but it's still very uncomfortable post. The only difference is, I suppose, you could check it down and have showdown value, or you can make some type of a hero call, which is rare, um, read list. So then I guess you do have some type of value, but can you guys see how this is just kind of like a bluff here? But then we feel required to raise it because it's a pair. Like the same way, you know, sometimes you you shove ace x or you raise ace x, you feel obligated because it's like, wow, I have to raise here. I'm on the button with ace three. I have an ace on the button. I have to raise. But sometimes you might just be bluffing without realizing it. Um, so I think that's something cool uh, to think about. Any questions about that hand? Like this quarter bluff. Add that. No questions about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So in this hand, uh, now we're going to look at two parts, the raising pre and the seabed. Okay, so in this hand, villain is a reg. Is there any, am I just assuming he's just typical, I, I don't know anything about him, or is there any special type of relationship? Is there anything versus this guy? Okay, we only know he's a multi-tabler. Cool. So looking at this hand, guys, what's what's the first thing you, you think here? Like, what play are you going to make? As many responses as possible, please. Get some interaction going here. Cool. Limp, limp or min raise. Agente's limping, that's good. Small raise is good too. Yeah, I mean, we can weigh the benefits, right? If you limp, he's not exactly at a stack depth that allows him to easily jam on you. Um, at the same time, if you raise, he's less likely to flat, even though maybe he might flat because he has approximately 20x stack. But most of the time, like a typical reg knows, and he should know, that flatting is generally a losing play. Um, but then the problem is, is that there are times where flatting becomes good. And this would be one of them if you wanted to flat in the big blind. I think that'd be fine. Um, yeah, and, and but I like what Chris is saying here. Like, often against a typical reg, a min raise can be better. It's because the, the lack of flat calling range. Yeah, limp small raise, definitely good. So, Big Nukes decides to put in a small raise here, which is great. The player actually flat calls. Very interesting. Um, now what? Jason says C bet. Okay, so um, what what sizing? I mean, you do have a name hand. You have the Jack Bauer. Twenty four. It's a good hand. You have the second nuts and Raz. Four K. Four K. <laughs> backdoor flush drop plus backdoor wheel. Yeah, exactly. Make your hand sound good. Yeah, somewhere around four K. You know, roughly forty percent of pot is great. Thirty nine hundred. Love it. Okay. Let's see what he does. So what do you think? Like a little, a little big? Yeah. I mean, in this, it seems like it's a, it's a little much, but again, it's not bad at all, right? Like this is great because what would be awful here would be checking because what's the point in raising pre if we're not going to follow through with it, you know?
So he bets this. Now what? No, 4.5K would be fine. Like, it seems like a little much, Agente, but it's totally fine. Like, it's totally fine. Now what? All we know is he's a multi-tabler. <laughs> well, I only chose this hand to talk about pre-flop and flop, though. Or, the first flop bet. Okay. Yeah, I, I fold most of the time, too. Um, So, if you guys uh have heard of a guy named Ament Mori, who's, like, pff, one of the best guys, he said something that I, I think helped me a lot as a player. And he said, like, in situations, we'll just add this here. Don't look at what play uh, the opponent makes, okay? He said, look at the play he didn't make. And this is something that can relate to hand reading. Uh, maybe I should copy-paste it down there or something. But he's saying, don't look at what he did. Look at the opposite of what he did and ask yourself, why didn't he fold? Why didn't he flat call? Why didn't he shove? And maybe we can start seeing this hand from a different perspective. Okay? Because Big Nukes is on to something here. The hands that raise here... that he's claiming he has, it's like, so what does he have here? Like, he's saying, he's telling us with this raise, I have, you know, ace-king, I have eights, I have ace-queen, I have ace-jack, I have ace-ten. weaker aces right right and then we start getting in this then i start wondering does he understand what he's doing when he raises a weaker ace here like that now he's not getting called unless he has that, that i don't know he could have a weaker ace right but then for someone who probably doesn't flat too often pre-flop like how would he play ace three maybe he could flat maybe the hands he's claiming he has besides king eight Great read. Our hands that would generally shove preflop over the raise. Like if he's saying, I have ace king, no, you don't, because you flatted preflop BVB. No, you don't. So at best, you're looking at a hand that's like ace three, ace four, ace five, something like that. Let's see these comments really quick. Yeah, could he have jack-10? Could he be semi-bluffing? Well, not saying that he can't do this, but wouldn't you expect anyone who is competent to not min-raise a flush draw here? I mean, like, as a default response. I'm sure there's people who do it who are good players. But it's looking at, like, the overall picture, if he had, like, jack-10 of clubs, you'd expect more of a jam than a min-raise. So now it's like, yeah, Puyon has a point. Like, could he fold to a reshove? Mike, what I'm confused about here is what he's saying he has because the hands that he's claiming he has are most likely in a reshoving range preflop. So see, something's wrong here. Now, I don't expect you guys to, like, three-bet jam flops after raising pre and c-betting flops with, like, the second nut low. I don't expect that at all. But this is a great situation where we can combine hand reading, situation reading, and whoa, what was the other thing I was going to say? Totally blank. Hand reading, situation reading, and just like the overall, just the feel of this. Like, it, I don't get what he's doing. But I don't expect you to be like, oh, I have four high, I rejam over you. Because 
one thing, and we'll talk about later, is just not getting carried away when you bluff. So this is something that I think experience helps with a lot here. And it is a dry flop because of his non-rejamming range. Or like remember last webinar, I remember Fitzinator said like a, a eight seven six flop was a, a, a really wet flop. And then someone pointed out, well, not in this particular hand, because that guy's range is weighted towards King Queen, King Jack, stuff like that. Cool. Or was it you? I don't know. Whatever. So that's what I think is cool about this. He's saying he has something that he probably would reach up pre, so it doesn't make sense. So Big Nukes reads into that, and he jams over. This is like pure invention value right here. But I wouldn't expect anybody to just do this as default at all. This is just like a feel, a gut feel, a combination of experience and hand reading, stuff like that. But I think guys like, like Jason, like if you started doing things like this, man – you could turn from insane to like nuts insane, eh? And I'm saying eh because you're in Canada now, eh? So, nuts insane, eh? It's a Canadian thing, Puyan. You just say eh. That's what they say in Canada. Eh. I don't know. So, anyway, not expected a boot at all. Um, but definitely a nice, I wasn't disconnected. Can everybody hear me still? Okay, cool, 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 cool. So in this hand, we're talking about limping. Um, okay, I'll repeat. So basically, limping, the next topic is like limping and betting or limping and stabbing, and a lot of people frown upon limping. Um, and if people do limp, they limit themselves to a limp stab. Um, back in the video library from a long time ago, there's a video called limp stabbing part one or something like that. I never really made a part two because I realized it is way too complicated. You can't just make a video on that. Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay, so basically in this hand, just to repeat, in this hand we have the our pro in the cutoff dotty, crazy good pro in the big blind, and psycho three bet flop shover big nukes in the small blind. And this is a final table of what's the buy in? An eight or 15? Probably an eight. Oh, it's $3 rebuy. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. 225K, of course. How did I miss that? And final table bubble. See? See how stage of the game <laughs> just changed everything? Let me rephrase. We're at the final table bubble with $3 rebuy. <laughs> Wait, how many chips are here? Yeah. 325, 425. That's 600K. Yeah. Are you sure this is not final table? Okay, well, whatever it is, watch this ballerness proceed. Okay, so what do you guys do here versus one of the best guys? Okay, welcome back. We last left off with the beginning of this hand before I went on Mega Tilt, and I was saying we have our pro Dottie here, the Mega Pro there, and crazy guy in the small blind. She's Louise. Okay. So I was, oh, spoiler alert. Sorry. I was asking you, what would you do here? And then I just kind of clicked through it. Whoops. Um, what would you guys do here? Like your first reaction? Raise because you assume he won't flat call too much. That's good. 11K, that's totally fine. Do you ever limp here?
well, why are you, um, yeah, all three options are fine for sure. I mean, well, through a third option being what? I mean, a raise could induce a light reshove. It could. He definitely has a stack size, and you have a stack size to where that's easier. It's a weird stack size where if you limp, it's harder for him to just jam over you, although it's possible. Why um, Why would you limp ace-x hands here more than connected cards? I'm curious. Hello, Poka says, got more showdown value, and if it's against a good rake, he is unlikely to put you on ace X as you just would have raised pre. True. But when does that make a difference that you're disguising ace X? Like, it usually only makes a difference when you flop an ace. And... There's a 7% chance of hitting a three outer if you have one card. So if the flop has three cards, then that means 21% of the time you'll flop top pair with an ace, which means that 21% of the time you'll be deceiving him. But then 79% of the time, you've just done what? You've either turned your hand in and check, 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 and it's a quarter bluff like the pocket fours, or you can stab and you're just turning ace-x into a pure bluff. Think about that for a second. Let me answer these. Um, so Big Nukes is saying, if I limp and he raises small, I can shove. That's true. Limping doesn't mean that we're ever just folding to a raise because there sometimes can be a dynamic where you limp shove. No, I'd say it's more rare, but it definitely exists. Chris says that, is a limp not inducing? Um, that's a great question, Chris. In different situations, it could be. And some situations not. Here, because of the stack depths, it looks less like an inducing spot. But if this was an inducing spot and you had something like ace-10, then we should be limping to induce. But most of the time, people just raise ace-10 to induce a reshove. So we should be thinking about how do we induce someone. I would say that most of the time, Chris, that limping induces a, a typical reg to shove when it's somewhere around 10 or less big blinds. Um, Big Nuke says, uh, because we're raised folding, but we never have an ace when we limp. Oh, answering, um, gotcha, answering the other thing. Um, and Big Nuke is right, we're bluffing most of the time anyway here. Um, so LOL Polka, I think that it's really important to think about that, like, even though you limp with an ace and you're disguising it, how well does an ace even flop? 21% of the time an ace flops. And maybe not not even 100% of the time does he not bluff at you. You know, like you could hit top pair and he could not believe you that you have an ace. Like, oh, he limped. He doesn't have an ace. But it doesn't mean he's going to play back at you 100% of the time. If he played back at you half the time when you flop top pair, that means that only 10.5% of the overall time when you limp with ace X are you actually getting deception value. And the other 9 out of 10 times then we're just missing value. So it's just kind of important to think about that. Yeah, it's a good point because you know what this is? It's It, it feels like two hours ago when we talked about the, the first hand, but in the other hands, we were saying with like fours, do you even realize you're bluffing when you min raise with fours? And I think that's like your ace-x hand. It's like, do you, I don't think you were realizing that you were actually just turning your hand into into a quarter bluff. Um, Big Nuke says, but isn't it better to limp ace X and raise fold three deuce? I guess in a way it would depend on how the range of your opponent would react to that, I guess. Um, I don't know. That's a great question. What I love about this kind of thinking is that now we're thinking about poker, you know, and, and, and these paradoxes where it's like, 
are we supposed to do something with a certain hand? Is there a reason why we shouldn't do this with a certain hand and things like that? And we can just think infinitely about these types of situations. So you add, because it's for sure better to get some value 10.5% of the time rather than hope to hit a straight with three deuce. That's a great point, actually. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Unless you magically flop a straight 10% of the time with three deuce. So Chris says, summary. Johan knows us. What can he react on a limp and... And how would he react on, on a min raise? Yeah, I mean, with no reads, you might just get a default responsive check. With some reads, he might be attacking the limp through raising you. But then if you anticipate that, you could just limp rejam. If he's shoving over your limps, then you would want to limp with hands to trap. Going forever. Big Nukes limps. He checks. Okay. So we get this swap. So now what, guys? I really hope we make it through this entire thing. <laughs> we'll make it good. Raise or check raise. Yeah, I mean, we want to do something. You guys from Europe are all so aggressive. I always notice all these guys, you always say raise when it's just a plain old bet. You're so aggro. You're like, bet 5K, but you guys say raise 5K. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so we can do something here. Um, not too many hands hit this flop. Um, you wouldn't expect someone like Johan F-Bomb to be calling with a lot of gut shots. Um, yeah, we can't fold. Chris is right, because then like, what's the point of limping? Well, wait, so you think, like, he could call with some gut shots here? Like, our ace, I mean, ace, deuce, and ace, five, unless, it, like, maybe those are in some checking ranges. Yeah, he could float. Maybe he is capable of that. Yeah, maybe I'm not giving him enough credit. I mean, he is one of the best, guys. Let's see what happens. So we bet about half pot. Seems so totally fine. He calls. Okay. What kind of hands do you expect him to have right here? Well, hey, Big Nukes, if he's floating, what can he float with unless it's a pure bluff? Like, he wouldn't probably be floating with King-Queen because you'd expect some type of a raise out of that preflop, right? So you're looking at some, like, 3x three, three hands, some 4x hands. He could even have a jack. It's very possible. Yeah. Good. Some flush draws. Um, maybe some ace-2s, ace-5s that don't shove pre. Weaker jacks. Okay. Because he does have a very wide range when he checks in the big blind, and we have to remove good hands from his range. So that's important to think about. Yeah, do six. See, that's the thing. It's like, I don't know if Johan F bomb is calling here with do six. It's, it's possible, but it depends on him. Do six just got there. Six, seven just got there. Ace, deuce just got there. Ace, five improved to a five. But a four and a three our third and fourth pair and that's a hard hand to call with now the five isn't necessarily a scary card for a four or a three but you could definitely put pressure on here so big nukes double barrels here hoping probably targeting a four or a three it's really important uh we talk about um why do we bluff to fold out better hands is one of the main reasons. What hands are you targeting is important to think about. Um, Big Nukes adds reasons why we have to bet. We get info and it's easier to play river if we hit a pair. We set ourselves up for a great third barrel on river. Right. And again, we have to mention again, it doesn't mean that you always want to do plays like this. We don't want to get carried away. You want to do it when you trust that it's the right time. Okay. Okay. So, but we want to ask, why do we bluff? To fold out better, and that means we have to think about the hands that we're targeting. What better hands on this board are we aiming to fold? 
a four and a three, which comprise a lot of his range when he flats right here, since he checked in the big blind with ATC minus raisable hands. So he's going to have lots of fours and threes and calling a flop with a four or three here seems fairly simple for a good player. So he has lots of fours and threes in his range. So we target those by double barreling the turn. And a weak flush draw. Yeah, a weak flush draw might fold. Um, I guess the weakest of flush draws would be like deuce X of hearts, which maybe still calls because then he has a straight draw too. The next weakest flush would be a four or five of hearts, which would be a pair. So maybe he calls because then he has a pair and a flush draw. The next weakest flush, it can't contain a seven of hearts. So it would have to be a six of hearts and a six of hearts. If he had a flush draw with the six of hearts, that means he would have a straight draw and a flush draw. So he would call. So then it's only if he has an eight of hearts. And then so the only combinations would be eight, nine of hearts, eight, ten of hearts, eight, queen of hearts, eight, king of hearts, probably not ace, eight of hearts because he would do something preflop. So maybe they're, wow, that was cool. I've never thought like that before. That was fun. Wee. It's weird because in some boards, like you can read into these weird things. And this is what poker is all about. It's like analyzing the logical things. It's just so hard to see those sometimes. Like, I don't think I could think like what I just said in game. That's really hard. I, I don't think I would think that unless I was one tabling. Um, weak Jack X is very possible. Jack Deuce is the weakest Jack X. That's also a straight draw on top pair. He's not folding. Jack three, four, and five are two pair hands. Jack six is a pair and a straight draw. He's not folding. Jack seven and eight are a little less likely because there's only 12. No, there'd be eight combos because there's a blocker to a jack and then a blocker to a seven and eight. He could have jack nine, jack 10. It gets a little less likely with queen jack, king jack, ace jack, obviously, because you think maybe it's more likely he does something preflop. But whatever. Well, that's too hard to think about. Like, <laughs> he double barrels here because it really looks like he has a four or a three. Good luck. He calls again. So what do you guys think he has at this point? Like, if you guys all had to put him on some hands. Jack Deuce, very possible. Very possible, Puyan. So Chris says maybe if he had like a big old draw, like example, the queen six of hearts, that he probably jammed the turn. I could definitely see that. Jack six is possible. Leon, I think that's a great read. I'm so glad the internet is alive right now. Six, four, deuce, four, five, six. Definitely possibilities. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Five, six is such a reasonable hand. He calls with a straight draw. Although, I don't know. Do you think he could he shove? It's a little deep. Maybe. Five, six is really reasonable. All combo draws jam. Yeah, because he's really psycho aggressive. I would assume because he's really good, right? So combo draws shove. Yeah, maybe he might raise on the flop with a draw. And then see, that's and that's what's so cool. When you start playing poker, like cash game, and you come across the same guy over and over, like those high stake guys, they have these like vaults of information, like it's stored in their head. Like he does this with draws, this and that and this, and it's just this insane metagame. But for basic hand reading purposes, I guess we could say, hey, if this guy's really aggressive, he would do something with a draw. All small sets are possible, maybe, but you might see a shove preflop out of those. Maybe if he's just like jamming over it, it's possible. But he could, I guess, check back threes or something. And this is a good point, big news. And he might be maybe more likely to ha be really aggressive with a draw. Okay. See what Agente says, and then I'm gonna see what that river card is. I forget. Four ten of hearts is very reasonable, and then like he calls a flop with four ten of hearts. Maybe he calls again. Maybe sometimes he shoves. Maybe sometimes he flats. I could totally see ten four of hearts. Here's the river. It's the deuce of hearts. So what gets there? All ace highs got there, but it doesn't look like anybody has an ace because of the action preflop. 
So at this point, it's like, if we triple barrel here, the only thing he can call us with is a flush or a six. That's it. And since we're thinking that a player as good as him might do something aggressive with a flush draw off the flop, come on. He's really aggro. How could a truly aggro player flat call here the majority of the time with a flush? Like, this is an aggro player's dream flop. If he's sitting there with, like, 10-5 of hearts, and he because he's really aggro, that's the nuts. Because we have to think about player type. If this was a complete random, it's very likely. I see a flat call here with a flush. So in a way, we can discount that from his range. And that's what's so cool about, about this. It's The two of hearts is an illusion, like the flush got there. But he probably doesn't have a flush in his range at this point because he would have raised the flop. So then the only other hand he can call us with is a six because it's less likely as an ace because the preflop action, even though it's slightly possible. How does he have a six in his range? He would have to have exactly four, six, three, six, jack, six, five, six. That's it. But on the other hand, we get all fours to fold, all threes to fold. Even some some jack cards like a so top pair hands, jack 10, jack 9, jack 8, jack 7. Those all fold. Yep, so 6x is basically the only hand he can have here that continues. But there's other hands he was calling with down. This seems like a prime opportunity to triple barrel bluff. Do I expect you to do this in game? No way, because it takes time to get to this point. Don't rush yourself. Don't try to copy this. You know, what's important about this hand is the thinking process that goes into it, because the more you do it, the more clear this will become to you over time. These are really difficult spots. This is like the epitome of, of like, sexiness right here like this is insane yeah 30k can be fine the difference is well i can see that actually 30k could be fine it could be totally fine because just in case he calls you're still left with a stack with three big blinds you have enough for folding equity and then you still have a chance to get back into the game So actually, that's kind of a cool point. He folds. So what did he fold? Probably like a... There's a lot of random fours and threes that he could call flop with easily and then hero call turn because it's fairly simple. Because a five makes no sense and it's not that scary. He could have a lot of like four, seven, four, eight, four, nine, four, ten, four, queen, four, king. Yeah, and Chris, you're right. It looks more for value. But at this point, you could also shove because it just he can't call us unless he has a six. So it's like you could just shove it, you know. But, of course, 30K would be good too. Okay. So other reasons why we bluff, you could end the hand now. Like if we go back to... Are you still there? Something just happened. You just bet to end it, take it down. Um, okay. To create image, maybe, like if you want to bluff and show or something like that. Like I think in that deuce forehand that Big Nukes actually showed it. Um, any other reason why we would bluff? Oh, you didn't show. Okay. I mean, I don't like to show bluffs, but in a casino, it's kind of a good strategy. Um, any other reason you can think why to bluff? Okay. Um, let's see here. Hey, Gente, um, do you use sit and go whiz? Like, does anybody actually still use sit and go whiz at all? Like, honestly, I, I'm just wondering. 
like you guys have heard of of the minimum edge and stuff like that, yeah. This Puyon, I, I can't remember if we we talked about something like this, but I think you'll like this. Um, there's a cool thing in Sit and Go is that. I don't think a lot of people do this because it's like something you have to figure out on your own. But let's go back to this very first hand where we know that the, uh, remember this, the villain in the big blind, we know he's not going to flat. So we know that we're turning our hand to a bluff. We recognize that. Okay. So even though this is an 18 man, I'm going to pretend it's chip EV just so we can relate it on a scale to 180 mans where it's mostly chip EV. So in this situation, what we're going to do is we are going to find the value of a bluff. Okay, and I want you guys to work with me on this. So our goal here is to find out how many chips you actually earn by making a bluff here. Okay, versus a guy who has X percent reshoving range, we'll just, we'll estimate, okay? So let's just say, keep it simple, what percentage of the time do you feel that this guy will reshove over? He's a tight regular who doesn't flat call and has no real reads on you. Cool. What do you guys think? Anybody else? Just uh, not necessarily the percent range because that's very vague, but just the frequency. Let's just take a guess. Cool. 20%. One out of four. Let's just call it one out of four. We'll do even wider, okay? So in this situation, let's figure out how much this is worth in chip EV, okay? So if you raise, okay, if you raise to 1,200, you risk 900, right? So if you if he reshoves 25% of the time, it means that you are going to lose 900 chips 25% of the time. Make sense? You raise 900 chips more, he reshoves a quarter of the time, okay? So that means on average, what's, can someone do that? What's one fourth of that? Then the other thing is, now you're gonna win though, you're gonna win the pot of 1100, 75% of the time. 225, thank you. So you lose 225 chips when he reshoves, eight, and you win 825 chips when he folds. And since he never flats, unless it's aces or something like that, then we can limit our calculations to this. So 825 minus 225 is, hey, this is cool. It's worth 600. It's worth exactly one big blind. Pretty cool. So now, Big Nukes, can you put this hand in your sit and go is? And basically what we're going to do, and I know we're not going to have a visual of it, but have you guys heard of like that minimum edge thing, right? Where people on forums are always like, set your minimum edge to zero you know, or, or do a 0.5 edge or do a plus 50 chip edge or whatever people's way of doing it is. There's a cool thing that I'm not sure a lot of people do. And what we're going to do is, is I'm going to have big nukes set the minimum edge to the value of a bluff. And then I want to know what sit and go is, is going to tell us. And this is the rare time when I, when I think sit and go is, is right. Can we do that? Can you show? Do I click that? Okay, let's try it. <laughs> Can you guys see this? Are you, so are they watching my screen and seeing you or are we all looking at your screen? As long as you can see, can, can you guys see? Cool. Okay. So, so big nukes, uh, let's set the edge. Okay. Here we go. Uh, before we change the edge, okay. Go to 20% put him on a 20% range because we're just saying approximately 20%. I know it's vague, but oh, sorry, 25, 25 we did, right? 
Yeah, because we did 25% of the time, okay? So look, so if we go, we would say, hey, zero edge, this is what a lot of people do. And they would say, hey, this is plus EV, you should shove ATC. But what if you know that the value of a bluff is 600? What that must mean is that any hand that's worth less than 600, Big Nukes, can you highlight where it says 295 chips? Thank you. This is saying that this hand is worth 295 chips to shove. But if min raise bluffing it is worth 600, then why aren't we doing that instead? Because if we min raise bluff, we effectively double the value of this hand. Does that make sense to everybody? Besides big news? <laughs> cool. Cool. So the question is, is if a bluff is worth 600, the question is what hands are worth more than 600 because those are the hands that are worth more than a bluff. Okay. So whenever you have a hand that's worth less than a bluff, you bluff it to maximize its EV. But if you have a hand that's worth more than a bluff, you don't want to bluff it because then you're losing EV. So Big Nuke, set the edge to 600 and the range it shows us will be what hands are worth more than a bluff. Those are the only hands. And those are super standard shoves. You all shove them. Or like min raise to induce, which would make them even more valuable. But do you see that? If you're playing in this setup where the guy only reshoves one-fourth of the time and he never flat calls, these are the only hands that are more profitable than a bluff. And this is exactly what we mean when we talk about plus EV versus plus maximum EV. Every single hand that's worth less than 600 here can be maximized in expected value if we min-raise bluff it in this situation. No. Oh, you mean if, if you shove? Yeah, yeah. Let's just say the 25% if he shoves. Because then you start getting into like, well, does he reshove a, a different range or, or something like that? But we just need to, we're doing it like this just to, kind of simplify it and, sh and show a point here. Because um, sometimes it's hard to gauge exactly what's going on, but if we had to sum it up in a nutshell, it's so much better to min-raise bluff the crappy hands versus typical regs because you're increasing the value of those hands. 5-3 offsuit is worth 295 chips if we shove, but it's worth 600 chips if we raise fold. So why not double the value of it? That's like someone saying, do you want $10 or $20? I'll take $10. Yeah. <laughs> it's so silly, right? Um, but big nukes, you do have a point. Um, the ranges could change. Like what if he's reshoving crazy wide on you? Then maybe shoving 5-3 is better. What about limping? You could also find the, the value in limping too. What if you limp to bluff here? You know, you could think about it like that. Give me 30 seconds. So, commercial break. So Big News says, but maybe it's better to just shove it because we might have better EV for that if he's calling shove way tighter. Right, exactly. So if there's a difference like that, like if you feel someone reshoves wide but calls tight, then shoving is better because you're blocking a reshove. Yeah, and see, like 10 nine of hearts is worth basically the same... Oh, sorry, it's different. Never mind. I thought it was 625. Oh, you changed the thing. Yeah. It was worth about the same as a bluff versus a 25% range, but there's some hands maybe you don't want to turn into a bluff. Like, just because something is worth 570 chips instead of 600, even though in theory it's better to bluff it, it doesn't mean that that's the best thing, you know, because then you lose double up equity and stuff like that, which will lead to future equity or future EV. Um, but basically, the moral of the story is the worst hands can sometimes double or more in value by turning them into bluffs. And if we recognize the first things we talked about in this webinar where if you raise fold, it's a bluff. If he never flats, you don't have to worry about that. And when you are aware that you're bluffing, then you can purposely turn those hands into a bluff. 
and and start getting some maximum EV things, some spots, stuff like that. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, like, I'm curious, like, what if, uh, for instance, you limped, right? You would still be spending 900 chips. You limp 300 and you bet 600, that's 900. So let's say that your limp was successful 25% of the time, or sorry, 75% of the time, and then 25% of the time you had to fold, you would make 600 chips. But people say limping is bad for 10 big blinds. I don't get it. You know? Um, but then, yeah, and then big news, you could think about flatting. Like, what if he flatted you? Right, because post-flop, then you get in this whole other world. Like, But then, what if you're capable of, like, double barreling and triple barreling with 8-7 offsuit and stuff like that? You know, basically, you open yourself up to so many forms of value. And those forms of value are blocked when you shove because now you can just like when you shove a hand here, like whatever it is, you won't only earn the amount that shove is worth, but then you miss out on what Puyon's saying invention value. Like there's just all this other value that's out there. And then shoving doesn't allow you to get it. Jason, I really wish Jason heard that. He'd probably like that stuff. Okay, cool. Um, so how do we go? Do I just close it or is that going to shut off my team viewer? Okay. Can you guys see my screen again? Cool. And so for, I, I've mentioned this before, but just to make sure everyone's clear on it, it's a good reminder. And if it's new, that's good too. I wanted to talk about like, see, when you raise here, you're risking 900 to win 1100. Let's just say that you're risking a million to win a million. In other words, one to win one, the same amount. Uh, three, four, five, four. So I have, I have a question, guys, and, and some of you know, like if we if we flip a coin against each other a bajillion times, I bet you a dollar and you bet me a dollar. So you're risking a dollar, but you win a dollar if you get the coin flip right. If we do it a million times, <clears throat> how much money will you win over time? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Depends on how we run. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You win no money over time. Because you would lose a dollar a million times, but gain a dollar a million times. So assuming you don't go bankrupt, like because you have a small bankroll and you don't coin flip select. <laughs> Yeah, there's no rake back. <laughs> Good call. Yeah, you can win money from rake back. But basically, you know, if you bet a dollar to win a dollar and you do it a bunch of times, you'll break even over time. So what that tells us is that anytime you risk one to win one, you will break even over time if you are correct slash win, whatever you want to call it, 50% of the time. And that's really, really important because that says a lot about bluffs. So, but I want to show you guys something here. And this is something that took me a long time to learn. My guys know this, but hey, Gente, you'll really like this. How do we know, like, is there a simpler way to know that if we risk one to one, right, that it's 50%? Watch this. So it's one to one, right? Take the second number. So whatever this X value is right here increase it by one okay and you get one over two so basically we're going from a ratio of one to one to a fraction by increasing that second number agente did that make sense oh thanks <laughs> Okay, I'll start over. So just say yes if, if you understand. Okay, uh, so we've established that from our flipping the coin example that if you risk one <clears throat> to win one, you'll break even over time. 
<clears throat> okay, um, another example. I'm trying to think, well, that's the best one I had. <laughs> so say, like, uh, we're thinking about, that's crazy. <laughs> In game, if you risk <clears throat> a thousand to win a thousand, and you're right half the time, okay? So that means you will win a thousand ships half the time. And that's plus 500. But it means you will lose 1,000 half the time. Sorry, I mean 0.5 for 50%. So that means you will lose 500. Overall, you make zero. You break even. So in other words, whenever you risk the, the same amount to win the same amount, if you risk a million to win a million, or if you risk a penny to win a penny, and you are right half the time, you will make zero over the long run. Does, does that make sense now? Okay, cool. So Agente, so what we're doing now is now we're trying to find out in any given situation how often that break-even thing is, what percentage that is. So I'm trying to show you how I go from one to one to 50% and a shortcut that you can use to analyze hands. So we started off with a ratio of one to one, right? You're risking a million dollars to win a million dollars. You take that second number, increase it by one, and one over two is 50%. <laughs> Flipping for one million, yeah. So what that means is, is anytime, say if you risk one to win two, a great example of where that exists is when you make a half pot continuation bet. Say there's a thousand in the pot, you bet 500. You are risking 500 to win a thousand. In other words, you're risking one to win two. Agente, did that make sense? Cool. So then we take that second number, increase it by one, we get one over three. And that means anytime you make a half pot C bet, if you win 33% of the time, you break even. So look at what we can do here is we can analyze this hand and say we are risking 900. The 300 doesn't belong to us because it's in the pot. So we're risking 900 in order to win a pot of 1100. Okay. So that's 900. is one okay because risk e we're trying to make risk equal to one okay now the 1100 is what is that that's oh did i do that wrong there we go 1.2 yeah thank oh thanks you wrote it so in other words agenda here we're risking one to win 1.22 because 1100 is slightly more than 900. Does that make sense? It's okay if it doesn't. Kind of confusing. Cool. So now we take that ratio of one to 1 1.22 and we increase the last number, this number right here, we increase it by one to turn it into a fraction. So 1 over 2.22. Someone find the percentage that represents. 45, thank you. So what this means is, is if you are successful in this hand, 45% of the time, you will break even. Okay, does that make sense? So Agente, now... Think about it. When we're in game, we're never going to be thinking about this. Stuff. Like, this is hard to think about in game. But this is really powerful. And by the way, it's really powerful in MTTs, by the way, since you're MTT pro now. What that means is if he has to, I'm sorry, if you have to be right 45% of the time, how often does he have to do something in order for you to break even? What's the most he could do it and you could still break even? 
Any idea? Exactly. Yeah, that means in this hand, a guy who doesn't flat, in order for him to exploit you here, would have to reshove greater than 55% of the time. People just don't do that unless they start getting pissed at you and start adjusting. Like who say you do it over and over and over and over. Then they start adjusting. So now I have a question for you guys. Let's say that it gets to the point where he finally starts rejamming 55%. He's not going to just like randomly rejam 60% only. Most of the time if they adjust, they're just going to get fed up and shove everything on you. Because if you're shoving jack five offsuit, he's probably going to shove like, like eight, four offsuit. He's just going to get pissed off. And then guess what happens? Now you can raise call with a wider range of hands and increase your value. Now you can have king 10 here, min raise, he shoves back jack five. Yeah, I can't see anybody ever rejamming 55% here unless they're jamming ATC on you. Yeah, Agente, so when you're in MTT, this is what I want you to think about because all this stuff is really hard, but this is what I want you to think about in game. Whenever it's folded around you, I want you to look at the pot size. And I want you to think in your head, if I risk the same amount that's in the pot, in other words, if you risk one to win one, I only have to be right half the time to show a profit. That's what I want you to think about in game because that's something that can convince you to raise a lot. Okay. So that's my advice too. Okay. This is a long thing. Uh, so we got one more hand here. We will make this brief. Okay. Okay. So in this hand, um, full preflop is totally fine. You could. Bruno Nero elected to raise. I, this might be some type of bubble spot. Yeah, you should raise more. <laughs> For sure. Okay. So these two guys are short. He can call them. He elected to raise here. Fold is totally fine too. Now we get a player. This hand is an exercise of, of hand reading. Okay. What we know is this guy is 11-5 over about 200 hands. He flats. Everybody folds. The flop comes this. Now what? We have a give up. <clears throat> check call or check fold. Lots of options. Don't see bet. So we have to ask ourselves <coughs> back to the very, very beginning, guys. Work with me on this. There are two reasons to bet overall. <clears throat> one is for value and one is for bluff. If we're betting for value here, we have to think about what hands do we get value from? What do you guys think? Yeah, queen jack suited, like a royal flush draw. Now the question is, is a guy who only plays 11% of hands, does he even have that in his range here with his stack size preflop? 15 big blinds, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. He might set line a pocket pair. Do you get value from that Puyon? Example, if he has pocket nines here, do you get value by betting king five? I mean, well, should be more clear. You get bluffing value, I suppose, but you don't get showdown value. Well, right, right. I'm talking about my, my exact question here is, what hands in his range do you extract value from here? Like worse hands than king five if you bet here. His aggression factor, I think, was actually he was fairly passive 
actually. Flush draws are the only things you get value from. Good. And Big Nukes was saying Queen Jack of Spades, 10 Jack of Spades, maybe. But then we have to keep in mind that because he's 11-5, does he have those hands in his pre-flop or calling range? Like, example, let's pretend that um, uh, Puyon flatted you here after you raised. Does Puyon have Jack, Queen of Spades in his flat calling range? No way. So we can discount that. <laughs> so basically there are no oh whoops misclick <laughs> sorry there are no hands here that we extract value from except maybe queen jack of spades and those maybe jam over you if you bet so that means one of two things we should either check or we should bet to bluff <laughs> Sorry, I don't. <clears throat> he only has 15 big blinds. He maybe has suited connectors. Probably not. But, okay, sure. So there's, yeah, there's no value in betting here at all. There's no, in, in terms of getting worse hands to call. Why do we bluff? We said to fold out better hands. Okay. So the thing is now is that if we can't get value from worse hands, we can either check or we can try to fold out better hands. You can, what better hands can you fold out here? If any. Hand reading exercises. Chris says nothing. Maybe some kings, but is he folding king jack? Maybe. Maybe folds king jack to a double barrel. Only way to fold him out is to check raise and outplay ace jack, king queen, king jack. Yeah. Are there any other hands I guess you could outplay, as you say? Like... Example, what if he flatted preflop with queens to trap? Could you get queens to fold here? But then that's not necessarily a better hand, I guess. So, like, I'm thinking king queen is better, king jack is better. He probably doesn't have weak ace x. There's no real better hands you can fold out here. Huh. So then check is the best play. Yeah, I don't know how ace-jack could fold. Because that's why he called with ace-jack preflop, maybe. Like, if someone calls ace-jack, he's trying to hit an ace. Beer. So I don't know if there's any hands that fold. Unless it's like queens, jacks, tens, but you beat those anyway. So actually, I thought this bet was great. Now I'm not so sure I like it. Because you're not really folding better hands, maybe king queen. Now I thought about it. Okay, he calls. His call represents something, okay? What do you guys feel are the hands in his range? And be exact. See, this is what I love. There's no like, oh, I think he's on 20%. All that like preflop stuff. Like this is real poker here. Ace, jack, ace, queen, ace, king. Good. Ace, king maybe rejams more often preflop. Because that's easy. He's on 14%. <laughs> I think, and, and you have a king as a blocker. And ace, king is a really easy jam. I think you can remove ace, king. But I think ace, queen, and ace, jack are very reasonable, especially because he's 11-5, he's tight. Well, more ace, x if he's a tight player, though, because that's the thing is now we're incorporating stats and we know that he's reasonably tight. 
His exact, again, uh, where did I write it? It's down here. He's 11-5 or something very close to that, over 200 hands. So him having ace, well, right, 200 is, it's small, but it's like, compared to the other sample sizes we're going to have, it's like the most decent we're going to see. We know that he's tight. No, we, we don't know like he's super tight, but he's tight. But so ace 10 might be a possibility, but I don't know if like ace 9, ace 8, ace 7, ace 6, stuff like that, if he's in a flat there. Um, so it kind of looks like we're down to what you guys are saying. Maybe these, um, maybe that, maybe, maybe. Okay, and ace nine. So we're thinking, oh, oh, good. Thank you. Seven, seven. Really good. Yeah, yeah. But then all the other hands, like twos, threes, fours, fives, eights, nines, tens, jacks, queens, those will all fold. Okay. So is there any point now when this comes out, like that doesn't really change anything? Are there any hands in the range that we gave him? Are there any hands that are vulnerable to a double barrel? Right, exactly. Like if he had eights, that's a really good point, man. We don't want him to fold eights. So... Of our range, so we have in order from strongest to weakest. This is his perceived range. Are there any hands that could fold here if we bet? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, we forgot to add that. Ace, ace is in his range. King, king. But there's one combo. There's three combos of aces here. There's three combos of seven, seven. There are 12 combos each of ace, queen, ace, jack, ace, 10, ace, nine. And then there's 12 combos. Oh, no, 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 no. Eight combos each of king, queen, king, jack. So what that means is we have seven sets, 48 ace-x, which is ace-nine through ace-queen. And 16 second pairs. So of all those hands, that means he has 71 hands, only 16 fold to double barrel. So that means in order, like 16 divided by 71 is 22%. 22.5% of his range is vulnerable to a double barrel, which is 1 over 4.5, I believe. Pot on flop was 26 So if you could break even 22.5% of the time, then you could bet roughly like one-fourth of the pot on the turn. But then if you bet one-fourth of the pot, which is like 12K, he would call with King Jack. So there's no point here. Check raise? I don't know. I don't know. Most of it, it seems like most of his range would, would still call. Would bet call. So there's no value in betting here at all. So check. He checks too. River's absolute blank. Nothing changed. Watch this. Checks back. There you go. It might seem simple like, oh, yeah, the top pair, but it's a cool hand. Because in this hand, I think the flop that I thought it was good at first, and that's why I chose it, but now looking at it, it doesn't make any sense. We don't get value from worse hands, and we don't fold out better hands. So there's no point in betting here. And then we just check, check. So 
So moral of everything, don't get carried away. The bluffs come from experience. Don't do it to do it. And overall, and especially at Gente, I think this will help a lot, like because you're talking about limping with ASAX hands. Is sometimes you bluff and you don't know it. Start knowing it. And I think it's something that will improve you guys as a player a lot. Yay, the internet held up. I don't know. I mean, his ace jack, like, he called for a reason pre, like, he's getting it in. Yeah, epic fail. Agree. Alright guys, I'm gonna hang up, but I'll still type.